Our final presentation in this session is coming from Kate Douthat, PhD, who is a senior research specialist at Rutgers University, the State University of New Jersey. Kate joined the Center for Remote Sensing and Spatial Analysis in 2022 as a senior research specialist. She works on a project in collaboration with the state of New Jersey to improve watershed planning. The initiative is called Watershed New Jersey, or Watershed NJ, and aims to make water quality information more available and usable for local stakeholders and to fill important gaps. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Cognitive Science from Vassar College and a PhD in Ecology and Evolution with a graduate certificate in GIS. Her dissertation research focused on plant biodiversity in artificial stormwater wetlands and the drivers of species composition in that system. Her research included both geospatial analysis, fieldwork, and modeling. As a graduate student, she also worked on science communication, both as a teaching assistant in the general biology and ecology programs, where she developed remote curricula for plant and freshwater ecology courses, and as a botany in action fellow at Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens. Kate has also worked as a green infrastructure consultant for a private residential community, where she worked on assessment and renovation reports. Before rejoining the academic track, Kate worked in a number of hands-on roles in agriculture and landscaping with an emphasis on sustainability. She can be reached at kate.douthat at crssa.ruckers.edu. I will pop that into the chat. And Kate will present the New Jersey State Regulatory Riparian Zone Map. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I I didn't mean to make you read the whole novel of my life. I appreciate it. Um, so assuming everybody can hear me, um, I'm I'm Kate, and as Laura said, I am a staff scientist at. Um, the Rutgers Center for Rem Remote Sensing and Spatial Analysis. And in recent years, we've done a lot of collaborations with the state of New Jersey to make these um, public facing portals, uh, especially for coastal adaptation data. So there's one called Flood Mapper, which looks at climate predictions and sea level rise. One of them is for coastal ecological restoration. So trying to identify wetland vulnerability for coastal wetlands. And then one more project that um, identifies really fine scale locations and interventions for um, coastal wetland restoration. So actually this current project is looking at freshwater. So this is kind of the first one that we have done that's um, looking at freshwater watershed management in the state. And um, Larry Torak from the New Jersey Department of Ecological Protection has been a, a partner on this, so I just wanted to call him out. Next. So when we think about watershed management in the in New Jersey, there's a lot of competing needs. We have um, the really urbanized developed areas. Um, around New York City, around Philadelphia, but then we have some amazing natural areas like the Delaware Water Gap where the Appalachian Trail passes through and the Pine Barrens ecosystem in Southern New Jersey that is a vast groundwater um, aquifer with amazing endemic species. Um, so whenever we're thinking about water quality, it has to um, balance the needs of development and kind of human land use with ecological integrity. Something I'll also flag on this slide is um, you can you can barely see because it's so fine scale, but this is the stream network um, throughout New Jersey. And so this is from the national um, hydrography data set. And this is what kind of the backbone of this project is that data set. Next. Oh, and I forgot to say, here we are. Well, actually, is that, that's where records is. Um, Ta-da. Next. Um, a really brief overview of the water quality policy that we're kind of uh, operating in. Um, 
the water quality is regulated kind of at the highest level by the Federal Clean Water Act and a few state acts. And then those come together to, to create the New Jersey surface water quality standards. And those standards for each stream segment, it dictates um, some of the, the designated uses. So like a goal, are we trying to have swimming, um, you know, contact recreation, and then some of the pollutant limits that are allowed. Um, and in practice, over in the, the blue uh, rectangle, there's kind of the elements that that dictate. So there's some monitoring of water quality, regulating discharges, so like, you know, from a wastewater treatment plant. And then the third one uh, next, where this project focuses is in the regulation of development. So one of the ways to manage water quality is by limiting uh, development. So impervious surface creates a lot of runoff um, and takes away from, from habitat. So um, specifically the Flood Hazard Control Act um, is going to, or it, it stipulates um, buffer areas around streams where regulation is uh, is limited to protect the stream. Next. So this project is to take that Flood Hazard Area Control Act to take the rules, the written rules, um, you know, lots of bullet points, um, and next put those on a map so we can actually visualize it and um, kind of see the impact of the rules spatially. So right now there is a map of those surface water standards, as I mentioned. So for each stream segment, there's a map that says this one has this limit and this use, um, but these um, flood hazard control act takes that and puts kind of a, another layer on it. Next. So this, these rules are creating riparian zones around the stream. So this is an example of different widths. Um, and in these riparian zones, development is uh, is quite limited. Um, and so that's kind of how water quality is being managed through this act. Uh, next. So the rules are gonna create riparian zones of different widths. I'll go into more detail, um, but this is just to show you there's um, kind of the highest protection for the best quality streams. Um, 150 foot is medium and then 50 for all other uh, streams. And then some, especially coastal streams, um, aren't covered. So they don't get the same. They're covered. They got their own rules. Next. One of the reasons to make this map is just so people know where the development restrictions are. So if you're a property owner or a developer, um, you need to know what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. And then in a bigger picture, um, it's going to be really useful to have a map of these zones so that we can ask some kind of big picture questions like, are they working as intended? Um, once we draw the buffers on there, do we see areas that just have like way too many variances, like they're not supposed to be developed, but they're very developed, um, or areas where protection may be insufficient. So this is gonna have a couple of different uses. Next. So the, the buffer widths kind of respond to landscape variability. So over on the east, um, you see kind of the, the tip of New York City of Manhattan and Staten Island. Um, that's the gray, the gray thing over on the, the, the right side. Um, and then as you get over into New Jersey, the development continues. And so stream resources in that area are going to be a little more degraded. But then as you move west, you can see um, these kind of uh, ridges where these are source water areas. And there's a lot of protection, a lot of natural areas. And so in that region, streams are um, in a lot better shape in terms of ecological integrity. Next. So the type of protection they get in that um, more natural area is a lot higher because the goal is to reduce future harm. So we say they're, they're in good shape. We want to keep them as they are. So these category one streams get 
the higher protection. And so in the darker blue, that this is the network of category one streams. And then you can see in the more Eastern portion, the, the light blue gray, those are not, um, they're not gonna get the same protection. Next. The next category of streams that get an intermediate protection is trout production and maintenance streams. So there's fewer of them, but um, those streams are going to get a 150 foot buffer to protect them from development. Next. And then habitat for threatened and endangered species that are critically dependent on a water source. So um, this could be amphibians, fish, mussels. And we have in New Jersey, it, in the state fish and wildlife program, they make this data set called the landscape project where they've projected habitat for all these different species um, all over the state. So this pulls from that data set um, and includes areas where they've projected these threatened and endangered species. And they also get a 150 foot buffer. Next. So if the whole project was just to, you know, throw a, a a very a, a fixed width buffer on these different stream segments. We would have been done in a day or two, um, but because water resources are all connected and there's a flow, the rules also protect upstream. So um, it gets tricky because a lot of this project involves tracing the upstream tributaries that are going to be contributing to these waters and also have a big impact on what's going on um, downstream. Next. So here's an example, um, and this is a zoom in on those category one waters. Um, if you take um, just a point and then trace all the tributaries upstream, all of these in magenta would also be protected under the rules. So one of the things we ha had to do in this project was um, trace all of the upstream segments from every protected stream segment. Next. And we did this um, again using that national hydrography data set and the network capabilities. So the stream network data um, includes a to and a from, and that allows you to understand the relationships between segments, um, what segment it came from and which one it goes to. Um, as well as directionality, which direction is it flowing? So it's a little hard to see, but all those little black things are arrows. And so that um, indicates which direction the stream is flowing so we can figure out what which is upstream. Next. And then one last trick is that all the different categories that I showed you, that category one, the trout maintenance, and the threatened endangered species, it's different distances upstream. So this is one example in the orange outline that shows um, sub basins. And so for category one streams, it's all upstream, but limited to the sub basin. So you can see these, these rules are really starting to stack. Next. So here's just a, a summary. So category one, it's um, all upstream, but within the sub watershed. Um, trout production is actually the easiest. It's just all upstream waters. And then the trout maintenance and endangered and threatened species is the trickiest because it's um, upstream tributaries um, up to one mile upstream. So we had to find one mile upstream. Next. So the first decision was which technology to use. Um, and I investigated the options in R, and there's a, some great packages that do this, but one of the challenges was that most of the packages, um, the networks, it works on an individual network. So earlier when I showed that magenta upstream, that would be considered one network. So because I have to do all of New Jersey, there's, I don't know, 50 individual networks. And so I just have to like feed them in individually and do a lot of processing. So I ended up settling on um, Esri's ArcGIS Pro trace network tool. And, and just this is kind of what the ribbon looks like for that tool. Um, partly because for some of the 
trace operations to trace upstream. I could just do it for all of the streams and not have to feed them in individually. So that that was a big um, difference maker when I had so many networks. Um, and the next, the so as I said, the the easiest um, the easiest one to do was the just all upstream because that actually works really well in this tool. So you feed it a number of points. So I would give it the um, end point of each segment and say trace all upstream, and then it, it you can either select or um, create a new feature class for the upstream. So that was pretty straightforward, but the biggest challenge was the one mile upstream. And so here I'm showing you that geoprocessing window, kind of what the options are. Um, and it's called an ISO distance when you want to trace a specified distance from a point in a network. And the ISO distances are surprisingly challenging um, in to implement technologically because the way it actually works is it's just adding up the segments end to end. So if I say one mile, it's going to take the segments and add them up end to end to end. And then when it gets to a one mile, it says you're done. But as you can probably imagine, the stream segments are all varying lengths. And so you don't, um, you can't get exactly a mile. So what I did was I subdivided all of the lines um, by, I forget math, but I think 240 feet. So basically um, the that when all of the those little segments were added up end to end to end, that the most um, error from one mile you could have was 5%. And I guess what I really could have done is I could have subdivided everything just by one foot. And then at the end, you you can get the exact distance. Um, and I actually didn't try that um, just because every time you change the network, there's kind of a significant amount of cleanup to make the network to make the tool happy with the network. So I was a little scared to um, make that many subdivisions. Um, but so I was able to, to trace the upstream one mile um, and then kind of put all of those different layers together. And at the end, next, uh, here's, here's an example of what that looks like. So this, each stream will say, you know, is it category one? Is it trout? Is it upstream from category one? Is it upstream from trout? Um, and then what I, the, the real meat that we want is what is the widest applicable buffer for any given stream segment? So in um, in that light blue, that's uh, the 300 foot buffers. Um, in orange, it's uh, 150. And then in yellow, it's just 50. They're neither specially protected nor upstream from from any anything. Um, and then in purple, it's hard to see here. Some of them, um, like if it's in a pipeline or a coastal area, they they have no buffer. Next, and then kind of the the end product is to actually show the buffer area, so you can show what's covered, what you know, what the limitations are. Um, Next, and here it's zoomed in a little bit, and now I've just made the the blue is the stream, and that peach is the is the buffer. So we can go back to those questions that I mentioned at the beginning, like is it working as intended? Are there areas that need extra protections? And so this area, um, if you look at the legend, this has a three hundred foot buffer, which means that it's a um, either a category one stream or upstream from a category one stream. So those are supposed to have the strictest protection. And what we see is actually in this area, um, there's a bunch of uh, houses, I don't know, warehouses, a, a mall, parking lot, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And so this, you know, it might've already been in place before the rules, there's a lot of possibilities, but now we can start to look at it and say, if we look downstream at the category one stream that's supposed to be protected, um, this is gonna give us a pretty good clue about, you know, uh, some of the reasons why we might see water quality issues in that area. Um, 
So there was a lot of uh, little bits from the rules that we weren't able to get in. For example, the rule actually says it's not from the center line, it's from the banks. Um, but we don't really have the ability right now to identify that fine scale of a feature and say where the bank is. So there's still a lot of this that needs to be done on the ground to, you know, if someone actually needs a permit. But this um, this really gets you started and allows us to ask some of those big picture questions. Thank you very much. Um, I think there's a little bit of time for questions if, if you have any questions before I wrap it up.